Um, okay, hey, I'm Gotham. I'm from Caltech. Uh, today I'll be talking about a new algorithm for learning and optimization. This is joint work with Adam Weirman and Youngjin, who's with us. Um, okay. Great, so let me tell you about a certain problem. Um, imagine you're a big internet company like Google or Amazon, and you have data centers all over the world. And you want to, be, uh, you want to take advantage of renewable energy when running these data centers. You want to be as green as possible. So what you say is, okay, I'll move my work, my processing work, between the data centers so that if the sun is shining in Montana or the wind is blowing in Denmark, I'll take advantage of that green energy. But there's two problems you face. The first problem is that you have uncertainty. You don't know exactly when the sun's gonna be shining or when the wind's gonna be blowing. The weather's always changing. And the second problem is that there's a switching cost. You cannot constantly be changing your mind every 30 seconds how you're going to distribute work. Right, it, it takes uh, some effort, some latency to move work around. Let me tell you another, about another problem. This is a project at Caltech. Um, the idea is, uh, what if we could build robots to, uh, to man the cameras at sports games? Instead of using a human uh, uh, photographer, why don't we use a robot to do it? So, you know, there's similar two problems here. Uh, I don't know where the basketball is gonna be, right? The basketball is always moving around, so it's hard for my robot to know where to put the camera. And the second problem is that uh, I want the video to be smooth. I want it to be graceful. If the robot is just jerking the camera around, that's going to look terrible. Uh, so I, again, pay a penalty for changing my mind, for being too quick to change my decisions. So there's a common theme here, which is that we need to make a series of decisions in the face of uncertainty without changing our mind too much. Uh, so let me tell you about a model for these kind of problems. Um, so this is very similar to the problem Ashok mentioned, the online convex optimization. At each round, I receive a convex cost function. I pick a point, which represents my sort of decision. And then I pay the cost of that point plus this uh, extra term, which is sort of a, a regularizer. So we call it the switching cost. It penalizes me for changing my mind. And let me just mention there's two differences between the problem Ashok mentioned and this one. So the first difference is that uh, I get to see the cost before I pick the point. And the second difference is that I get, there's a switching cost, right? And this problem is called uh, smooth online convex optimization because it's a smooth version of this classic OCO problem. And of course, my goal is simply to minimize the total cost. Great. Um, okay. So there's, I think, two reasons why we care. The first reason, which I already hinted at, is that there's a lot of applications for this problem. For me, as a theorist, uh, I think another thing that's really exciting about this problem is that it sits at the intersection of two different communities. It's a lot like the problems in online learning, like classic OCO, which Shok mentioned. On the other hand, it has this switching cost, which is pretty commonly associated with problems in online algorithms, like K-Server. So it has kind of the features of two different communities. Right? And as you guys know, these two different communities measure performance in two different ways. Uh, online learning tends to use these sort of regret style algorithms, regret, uh, measure in terms of regret, compare against the best fixed action, whereas online algorithms compares against the dynamic offline optimal via competitive ratio. Um, so, you know, these two different communities, the first thing you want to know if you're in learning is, can we get sublinear regret, which is what Ashok talked about in his talk, and if you're in the online algorithms community, you want to know, can we get a constant competitive ratio? And there's been a lot of work on both of these problems. Uh, in the learning setting, it's Pretty simple. We just use online gradient descent, which we've all seen before. You know, these gradient style algorithms are the right thing to do in this problem. On the uh, competitive ratio side, it's a little bit frustrating. Everything we know after like 20 years of work is in one dimension. We don't know anything at all beyond that. Uh, this is kind of frustrating because the problems I told you about were all high dimensional problems. Like, for example, this uh, this geographical load balancing, environmentally friendly problem. There's a lot of servers, there's a lot of variables to handle there. It's not a one-dimensional problem. And because of this, there's been a lot of work in the recent years on sort of using predictions, right? Can I do better if I have extra information? Um, I can explain why uh, there hasn't been uh, a nice, clean, competitive ratio result, because there is no nice, clean, competitive ratio result. Uh, any algorithm for this problem must have competitive ratio that's growing at least in the square root of dimension. You cannot have a nice constant competitive uh, algorithm. And so that raises the question, 
under what conditions or what restrictions on the cost functions can we get that constant? That's what this talks about. So let me just jump right in. So we have a new algorithm called online balanced descent. And for a certain class of cost functions called polyhedral cost functions, we can get a competitive ratio that's a little bit more than three. And this is true irrespective of the dimension. It could be dimension 100 quintillion, the competitive ratio would still be th roughly three. So what is this class of cost functions? It's actually very simple. This is a first order analog of strong convexity. Strong convexity says that I'm growing at least quadratically away from the minimizer. Polyhedral is simply I'm growing uh, linearly away from the minimizer. If there's a linear, linear underestimator, it's called po uh, polyhedral, and this alpha is the parameter that measures how steeply uh, that, that underestimator is. And let me also mention on this, this uh, three, this competitive ratio, that there's actually a known lower bound of three, so we're pretty close to being optimal. You cannot do much better than this algorithm. Um, okay, great. So I do want to just quickly tell you a little bit about the algorithm. So when I started working on this problem, I thought, you know, this is really easy. Uh, I'm at some point xt minus one, and then a new cost function arrives. It has minimizer, let's call it vt. And all I need to do is I need to decide uh, how close I should move towards vt, right? I want to minimize, minimize my cost, so I'll just take some step towards vt, and I'll just decide how big a step to take. It turns out this intuition is wrong. It is not always in your best interest to move towards the minimizer of the cost function, which is kind of surprising to me. Let me show you why. I didn't tell you anything about the geometry of the cost function. So suppose the level set looks like this. And here's, in that case, would I still want to pick the point xt? No, here's a smarter point. Let's pick the projection of xt minus 1 uh, on this level set. This is clearly a better choice. Why? Well, I paid the same hitting cost because they're on the same level set. So that's the same. And I paid less movement cost because this point is closer. It's the projection. So this is strictly a better point. I, I had less cost by picking this point. So that tells me something uh, kind of fundamental here, which is that any point I pick should be the projection onto some level set. But the question is, which level set? There's so many level sets. Uh, so let's call the set of all possible, possible projections x of l, right? It's this line, this, this curve, that's the set of all projections. So I'll go ahead and tell you the algorithm right now. It's pretty simple. OBD says this. Let's start off at xt minus 1, and I'll move on this line towards the minimizer until my switching cost is equal to my hitting cost up to this tuning parameter beta. So I'm going to balance these two different costs. OK? Uh, and that gives us this sort of three competitive algorithm in all dimensions. And you know what's exciting about it to me is that if you think about it, I told you this problem lies at the intersection of two communities. Well, so does my algorithm. It has ideas from both communities. So it's a lot like gradient descent style algorithms, right? Because gradient descent style algorithms do the following. They say, OK, I'm at a, uh, I have some cost function. I'll look at the level set of that cost function, and I'll move in the gradient direction, which is orthogonal to the level set. Uh, online balance descent says something similar. It says, I'll, I'll pick a point which is orthogonal, but instead of being orthogonal to the current level set, it'll be orthogonal to the level set I'm landing up on, because it's a projection, which is also orthogonal. OK, so in that sense, it's sort of a step ahead version of gradient descent, where I'm sort of taking, looking into the future a little bit. And it also has a dynamic step size to achieve this balance. On the other hand, it's a lot like uh, algorithms in, com in online algorithms community, competitive ratio kind of stuff. Because if you think about it, I'm balancing these two different kinds of costs, which is just sort of the renter buy philosophy, which has guided most of online algorithms uh, research. Right? So ski rental kind of algorithms look like that balancing two different kinds of costs. OK, in my uh, last minute, let me just say that I made it sound as if OBD is a specific algorithm for a specific problem. But really, this is a much more general framework. right? OBD has two different components, projection and balance. If I play with the projection part, I can actually get a different kind of, I can get similar results for different kinds of switching costs. So instead of being L2, I can get L1 or you know, things like that uh, in some, some cases. And if I play with the balance, I can get different kinds of performance guarantees. So if I want to get no regret, I can do that. I just change the balance condition. So really, this is a more, much more general framework. It's a way of designing algorithms that hopefully will lead to sort of new performance guarantees for new kinds of problems. OK, with that, all in there. I'm happy to take questions. Um. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, thanks. Is there a question? Come on. What? Yes. So, so this sounds like an implicit update. Yes, it is exactly. Yes, that's, I was we were talking about this. Um, yeah, so it's definitely very connected to the implicit update kind of work, and uh, we cited his work uh, in that. Um, I think the, the point here is which, which implicit update are you doing, right? The advance wasn't that we invented implicit updates, uh, rather we realized that the right implicit update is to balance these two different kinds of costs. Yeah. And we showed that it could be done efficiently in the paper. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to the speaker again.